everybody. This is Brent Choate, and I'm the director of the Division of Rehabilitative Programs for CDCR, otherwise known as Dr. C, the Rehabilitation Guy. You may have seen me on some of the other programs. And I am uh, here today for our second episode with three gentlemen that run an organization called CROP. And I'm going to have them explain a little bit about what they do. But uh, we're really here today to further a discussion that we had earlier this month and, and provide episode number two for the main purpose of, of providing some hope and to help you that are, that are incarcerated to make uh, plans for, for reentry and, and even how to better survive while you're, while you're currently incarcerated. And, uh, you know, we talked uh, last time a couple months ago and since then, I've learned that, that you guys bought a prison in Colorado. What's that all about? Because um, you're formerly incarcerated and, sure. and then you buy a prison. So that just doesn't make sense to me. Not something you so, hear every day, right? Yeah. <laughs> so to be, uh, just to be, to be fair, we didn't actually buy a prison. A prison was donated to our, or, our organization. It, it's a, it used to be a private prison that formerly housed uh, women and children. And, um, you know, a charitable donor thought that it would be appropriate to, to, to give us possession of this facility so we can repurpose it into something new. Um, we're, we're in preliminary, like, discussions right now about, other, about possibilities of what we can actually do with the space. One of the, the ideas that's really appealing to us is to transform it into like a data center where they might have storage units or different CPUs and processors that are used for various uh, te technological um, uh, functions out here in, in the community. Uh, but so you're not talking, you're not talking about storing people's junk or their boats and cars and things like that. You're talking about data. So that's sure. Well, what does that really mean? So it's like, I mean, really, you know, on the screen right now, there's 60 years, over 60 years of incarceration. And one thing that we didn't have a lot of exposure of inside is technology or like the digital landscape. And when we paroled, we, we realized that, you know, that's pretty much what's going on out here. Uh, technology runs most everything out here. And there's so much of it, in fact, that they have spaces, huge spaces that are utilized to, to store data like cloud services and, and, and different, security. yeah, security to keep data secure. So, you know, that, like I said, that's just one of the possibilities we're exploring of what we actually want to do with this facility. Um, we may be open to other ideas, but ultimately what we're, what we're going to make sure we're not doing is, uh, you know, housing human beings inside of it. And we're going to transform it into something else that's very useful to the community. So will you use it for any form of training? Uh, Ideally. Uh, Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. I'll, I'll take that one. Hey, I, I just want to preface the fact that this prison is empty. There's no women and children in the prison right, right now. Nobody in the uh, now. Yeah, it's empty right now. <laughs> it, it, it's, 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 it's an empty prison facility, and we, and we all, as a team, had a chance to fly out there uh, and rip out some of the bunks and toilets and really tear down the infrastructure from the inside, tear down some walls to repurpose the lobby area. And the idea initially is, as Jason mentioned, is to turn it into a co-location data storage cloud service uh, facility for both consumers and for businesses. And then the other thing that's been floated to us recently is to be able to use it for formerly incarcerated people in Colorado. Uh, it's about an hour outside of Denver who can use it for fire camp training or other different types of trainings uh, out there and really just repurpose it for the community and turn it into something positive that people can get a benefit out of out other than, as Jason mentioned, just warehousing human beings. So it's pretty fascinating. I know you shared a couple of videos with me where you guys were inside with sledgehammers destroying walls for the purpose of renovation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's got to be currently incarcerated. Maybe some of their dreams is to, to take a sledgehammer. <laughs> to the, <laughs> but uh, you were able to do that. It so was a, that's great. It was really surreal. And if I can add one thing, Brent, you know, uh, there was, as I was sitting there with, you know, uh, a toolbox of, uh, you know, wrenches to unscrew the bolts. I, I was reflecting on something that I thought was, it was kind of a profound thought to me. Like, you know, I spent over 20 years in prison and, you know, I would be 
remiss in admitting that, you know, I would wonder often, like, how will I get out of here someday? Will I ever make it out of here? And I would, like, sit on this steel bunk, and I would, I would think, like, it's impossible to get out of here. But, but when I'm sitting in this prison that, that we acquired, and I have these tools, like, we're, I was literally dismantling a prison. And I think it was an appropriate analogy for my thinking as well, because when you, when you have the right tools, anything's possible. Anything's possible. It was just, it was amazing well, to me how easy it was to remove those bunks with the right tools. And the same is true in my thinking, right? So if I have the right tools up here, then anything is possible for my future. So it's kind of like a metaphor for dismantling prisons in a, uh, in maybe even getting out of prison and rehabilitation is one of those tools absolutely to be able to help dismantle prisons and help people successfully re-enter and you mentioned earlier that between the three of you you have 60 years of of incarcerated experience and and uh so you're the experts in my opinion and i i certainly don't know what i'm talking about and that's why i'm i'm here talking to you and uh every time we do one of these episodes and i i hope we do more I, I want to have a central theme. And today I was thinking that one of the things I'm really interested in is to learn more about how people that are currently incarcerated can better uh, withstand peer pressure within the inside. And peer pressure may not be the, the prison term that you use, but uh, it, it uh, strikes me that you know, I'm speaking to three successful men that are doing great things for their community but yet 60 years of incarceration, you must have experienced the peer pressure, but somehow you overcame that. And uh, so talk to me a little bit about the peer pressures and I'll start out with a broad question, which is how do you overcome peer pressure and you know what are the types of peer pressure? Sure, I'll take just a quick stab and before I turn it over to Richard and Jason who could speak about that more eloquently than I can. Uh, for me, peer pressure, you're right, may not be the best uh, term for it. To me, I, I like to use the word culture, the culture of what happens on prison yards. Uh, and so there's, there's ways that we can adapt and ways that we can change or elect not to buy into the everyday prison culture that exists on the yard as an individual. And I think that for me, uh, making a personal decision for myself to do something constructive with my time allowed me to create my own culture, my own internal culture of how I was gonna deal with having a life sentence in prison and then what I wanted for myself once I got outside of prison. Because I think inherently every man and woman who sits inside of a prison cell wants something better than that prison cell. We don't always know the best way to go about it or how to go about it given the culture of what's going on in prison which sometimes involves peers. But it, it starts with self and making that decision that despite the outside circumstance, despite what's, despite what's happening in the day room or in the yard or wherever, you're gonna make a choice to try to take lemons for lack of a better metaphor and turn it into lemonade. Great. Yeah, <clears throat> go ahead, Jay, I'll go, I'll go last. Well, I think, I think Ken pretty much nailed it. Um, I mean, that was my experience at least, you know, uh, both Ken and I are black and my experience with the black culture in prison is that your conduct is your currency. So when I committed my crime at 20 years old, I, I made a relatively early decision that I didn't want to continue to bring pain and disappointment to my family. So I, I made a conscious decision to, to stay out of the way for the most part and start focusing on my education. And as a result of that decision, uh, I actually experienced a lot of support. Um, there was some criticism from, you know, guys that, you know, I started off on level four yard and it's like, oh, look at this, this square going to school. But there was also a, a considerable amount of support from guys who were like, look, the youngster's doing the right thing. So, so leave him alone. Um, so, so in my experience, in my experience, you know, when I, when I made the decision that I was going to start doing something positive and constructive with my time, I actually received some support. Um, so that was my experience. So you mentioned the the conduct is your currency. Mm -hmm. Who is the currency with? And, and could it be different groups where you have currency? So I think your currency was with your family. It's what you were sure. talking about. 
but with my with my family and it was also with the people who I lived with I mean uh, I am a, a, a firm believer that I'm responsible for the general context of my life um, to give you an example you know because I was uh, so committed to school it wasn't uncommon like it wasn't weird for someone to come to my cell door and ask me for help with math or to ask for some guidance in how to write a 602, right? Like this was a context that I was intentional in creating in my life. And, you know, on the other side of that, there, there were other people who make other choices. And, you know, it's not a surprise when uh, ISU is running in your cell um, if you're involved in certain things, right? So it's, so that's what I mean by your conduct is your currency. The way you choose to carry yourself is essentially all that you really have in prison at any so given time. Mm -hmm. So you could also be developing currency in a negative way. Oh, absolutely. To, you know, to absolutely. gain gain points with people that that uh, want to perpetuate negative behavior. That's a different type of currency. Absolutely. For absolutely. for me, um, I, I there's a there's a saying that we use on the crop team, and we used to do a lot of um a coaching on the inside, and um, uh, we asked the question, "What are your highest commitments?" And early on, early on, uh, you know, some of our highest commitments were I want to, I want to get, a, I want to go along. I, I went along to get along. I went along to get along. So uh, I was more committed to being a good dude than to in prison and to get that currency uh, uh, from others than I was my own family, than I was for my own freedom, uh, than I was for a college education and to get out here and one day be a responsible citizen. And, and at some point, when I made it, when I made another decision, okay, um, I've I've failed my family, I failed society, I failed myself. I got myself 25 years to life sentence at the age of 20. I spent all of my 20s and all of my 30s in prison, and I got out at the age of 41 years old. And at some point in the, in at the end of 2000, I've been sober now from alcohol and drugs since June 10th of 2000. And and I had that aha moment that one day I want to get out. One day I want to be free. I don't want to live this way in prison this, the, all this whole time. Um, I want to be free. And that's one, it's one of the things I say when, when I share about my incarceration experience is you got to get free in there before you could get free out here. And one of the best ways to be free is to, is to take a stand, to plant your flag. From this point forward, my family, my freedom, and even if it's not physical freedoms, you know, some people have 60, 80 years, you know, and, and that day may not come. But for me, it was my family, my freedom, uh, my education. And I didn't want my nieces and nephews to ever know the old me, the, the, the drug addict and the, the, the committed to a uh, criminal way of living. Um, so I want to I, I want to ask I want to ask you about the comment that you made go along to get along. To me, I would think that that some people go along to stay safe, and maybe maybe they're just going along with the crowd so they don't get hurt. And right. did you have experiences like that where you felt like you just needed to to do something sure uh, negative yeah, sure. just for your own safety? And how did you overcome that? I think it was um, survival based on fear. You know, I was, a, I was afraid. I was afraid, uh, you know, I was 20 years old going into a level four prison for um, the first time in my life. No one in my family had ever been to prison and I didn't know what to expect. All I wanted to know is it's sort of like an astronaut when he's in space, uh, the number one goal is keep the spacesuit alive. And all I know is that I wanted to live and, and I wanted to make it. And I didn't have all that, all the tools that Jason talked about um, uh, the good tools yet. And I didn't know how to access them. So early on, you know, I was, uh, going along based on fear. Um, what other people would think of me, you know, I wanted them to think that, um, that I was, that I was willing to, you know, be down or be willing uh, do whatever it took to, to just to make it in there for all those years. And, and, you know, what surprised me the most is, when I went to the when I went to to the same people that I I used to house with, I'm from Mexican from Southern California, and when I went to them 
and said, hey, you know what, I want to make some changes with my life. Um, I had fear that I would be judged or I'd be ostracized. And there was some of that. But uh, largely there was, hey, man, go get it. Go get your education. Go do whatever you got to do to get out of here. And um, and it wasn't about going to another yard or anything like that. You know, anybody can change their life wherever they're at. And and um, and I and I did receive that that support, even when even when there were riots going on, you know, and they said, oh, well, that's the guy. He's he's over there um, <clears throat> running programs and he's in the church and and, and he's uh, uh always working on preparing for board and, and, and facilitating groups. So, you know, we, we were more, we got more committed to creating a new culture, a culture of freedom and responsibility. I think that's, I think that's probably the, um, the best choice to transform yourself in there, no matter where you are. So you never went S and Y? No. Any other thoughts on, I think that Richard, you know, encapsulate, encapsulated um, our general perspective uh, as far as the ability to determine our future, no matter what the situ- circumstance is. Um, you're looking at three guys who uh, made it through prison. We were, we were all general population. And, you know, we started off in, in the late 90s when there wasn't a whole lot of hope for people with life sentences. And, and now we're, we're all free. And we're we're doing good work in the community, and we're successful. And it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that prison held us back. It's that we chose to push forward in spite of the circumstance. Um, and that's available to anybody if they really want it. So you took control of your own life instead yes. of waiting around. And and found and found other men and uh, in you know in women's institutions as well but found other people who were committed to do something positive and productive with their time yeah. in alignment with what I wanted for my future. Brand, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, <clears throat> Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Yes, uh, we just had donated 500 copies of that book <laughs> and we're gonna be distributing them to the reception centers and have every brand oh, new, every brand new uh, person coming out of the county uh, will have the opportunity to read that book. It's a great that's read. a great read a phenomenal book and you know that like that the song that says you know the lights came on in georgia for me when i when i read that and there, there were other books as well but i remember victor franco you know he's in a nazi concentration camp you know every i believe everybody in his family had been killed in the, in the concentration camps and he said the last of human freedoms is the ability to to make your choice and and to have that existential freedom and I was thinking, man, this guy's in a concentration camp. His, he's, you know, skin and bones. I've seen all the, the movies and the documentaries, and and he's probably just getting a little tiny bowl of soup or, you know, stale piece of bread and working twelve hours a day, and around other Muslim and just death and the smell of death, and he's saying the last of human freedoms is the ability to choose your attitude, and and. And, um, and that really affected me. And even to this day, being around on crop, we always have this saying that we say, there's two types of people in this world, two types of people in this world, lifters and leaners. And what are you going to be? Uh, you know, you get around a leaner and you feel pulled down, you feel weighed down, you feel burdened. You get around a lifter, you feel, you feel optimistic, you feel positive, you feel, you know, pulled up. And, and that's, that's the common denominator amongst all of us is we're, we don't spend much time on being pessimistic or negative or looking at the, you know, looking at the bad side. We're always thinking, you know, how can I change? How, how, could I, how could I help somebody else? How could I be of service? Even in the AA community, one of the ways to freedom is, is to be of service. No matter where you're at, find a way to be of service. It truly is a, is a way to freedom. It sounds to me like the lifters and leader, leaners analogy, you could actually start out as a leaner but you need to look for a lifter. You know, find, <laughs> find, find the lifter in your area, your living unit, and start hanging out with them. Yeah. And they'll, they'll help you turn into a lifter yourself. Sure. That's a fact. So, Ken, what are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are mirror and parallel to what Jason and Richard said, I think, at the end of the day. 
people have to make personal decisions and come to the realization that in order to really survive prison in a meaningful way and create that change, you have to think outside of the prison walls that are around you. One of the things that I found is that there's typically low expectation in prison. Uh, most of us come from low expectation environments where there's not a lot expected. Uh, and when I used to talk to different uh, guys and groups and stuff like that and talk about hopes and dreams and passions and desires and things that we want to do, typically the ceiling was very low most of the time. And it, it, it caused me to realize that, you know, people in many cases haven't had a pathway to thinking bigger and to thinking that more is possible for themselves in life. And, you know, I'm, I'm a testament. I got out, you know, after serving 24 years, had very little and just saw a, a big, huge community out here of people that embraced people that have experienced uh, imprisonment the way that I did and who wanted to make a change. There's thousands of people, uh, men and women who are formerly incarcerated who work for nonprofits now in California who are working every day to make change, who have made a decision to help others, who have made a change to end systems of mass incarceration and advocate for programs, advocate for laws to change. And that work is going on every day. And, and really the theme of that is, is that people realize the world is bigger than themselves, right? And so now through this service and this work and, and the decisions that, that these men and women have made, they're able to have the lifestyle that they only dreamed about, where they have houses, where they have cars of their choice, where they have families, where they're able to take their kids on the weekend and buy the type of clothes and stuff that they want. And really just uh, really uh, leveraging their experience in the prison system. And so I think that if, if people start to understand that the sky's the limit in reference to where you can take your life, and you have to come to that realization. And if you come to that realization, I think you start to leave a lot of the small thinking behind, a lot of the everyday shit that we see people thinking about, pardon my language, uh, and really focus on uh, self-improvement, leadership, and uh, pursuing our aspirations on the streets. Yep. And I would mm -hmm. add one more piece to that that's very important because Richard touched on it earlier about guys that have 60 or 80 years. One of the things that impresses me about Jason and Ted, who Ted's not on the call today, he's the executive director, is both of these guys together had over 60 years to life. And through the attitude and the stuff and the decisions that they made that you've heard Jason talk about today, they were actually able to work themselves out of prison. So even though you come into prison with 30 or 40 years, right? There are people every single day, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna be on a phone call tomorrow with the governor's office talking about uh, clemency, computations and pardons. Every single day counts for what happens to you in the future. And so if you put five or 10 years, 15 years in of positive programming, working, going to groups, doing all the things necessary, you very well might be sitting on a Zoom call with Brant Choate 15 years from now talking about your sentence got commuted from the governor because you, you, you made a decision that you were going to have something different for your life and that you were going to have something different for the community other than what you've had in the past. Well, and I think it's, it's also very interesting to hear that, that you're formally incarcerated and you're going to be on the phone with the governor's office about commutations. And so you're able to give back in a big way. And in some way you have a say in, in terms of who gets out of prison. Um, well, I don't know if I have a say, you know, but we definitely advocate for men and women who are filing for uh, pardons and computations. And they, we definitely as a community out here have a voice. I mean, we have a very uh, open governor in that way. And, and there's a lot of advocacy going on about how computations and pardons are decided. I've had conversations with the governor about the way the BPH decides uh, to parole people and what really constitutes real threats to society versus what's not. And you know, the, the legislature for the most part is very open to hearing uh, people who are closest to the pain points. They realize that they don't understand everything that goes on in prison. They understand that they don't have any experience with dealing with prisoners for the most part. And so they wanna hear input, real input, from people who have experienced and lived it so they can have more informed decisions, very much like you do on a regular basis. For sure. So, so you don't get involved in uh, 
individual commutations, but but perhaps policy, uh, you advise in some of the policy that's set and, and they listen to you, which is, is great. Exactly, exactly. So any, uh, any final messages for, for the man or woman that's incarcerated now and just they're, they're fearful of, of doing what's right and, and jumping into programs and participating in rehabilitation? I would just want to reiterate what Ken offered. Um, one of my favorite quotes is that the investments you make in the present purchase your future tomorrow. So when I first uh, started doing time back in 1999, uh, there wasn't much opportunities. There weren't many programs, if any. Um, you know, early 20s on a level four, there wasn't a whole lot going on. And I still, at my best, found something positive and productive to do, whether it was read a book or, um, you know, start taking one correspondence course at a time. Uh, and, over, and over time, those daily investments added up to where I'm at right now, which is free, you know, home with my family, working with my friends, doing great work for this organization and in the community. And the same is available for anyone, for anyone. Uh, and, so and the beauty of and the beauty about today, um, the current landscape of CDCR, is there's an abundance of opportunities inside. There's things you can do. There's school. There's there's CTE programs. There's a, there's a lot of different positive things that you can involve yourselves in that will literally pave the future tomorrow. So, and, what was that statement that you made at the very beginning? The investment you make now. Sure. Yes. The investments in the present purchase the future tomorrow. Investments in the present, purchase the future for tomorrow. Yeah. And, and keep, in, keep in mind, Brant, on that note, that every one of us on this call had, you know, the, the sentence that we got, had it say, we're slated to die in prison. Right. right. I mean, I had 52 years to life. I wasn't expected to ever walk out of prison. My earliest board date when I came to prison was in 2048 the year 2048, I would have been 82 years old. And, you know, I would just encourage people and invite people to realize that we're out here along with thousands of other people that we named advocating for changes in the law. The pendulum has kind of swung to redo or reimagine what criminal justice in California looks like. That's very real. It's happening every day. Conversations are happening every day about restorative justice and, and different sentencing models and et cetera and so forth. So now is the opportunity for people to really reflect for themselves about whether they want to die in prison, so to speak, or take advantage of some of the pathways that are available for them to get out and live the kind of life that they always imagined for themselves. I've yeah. met pe people that uh, have the similar, similar sentence that you did, but they're still there. And the reason why they're still there is because early on, they chose not to participate in themselves or to invest in themselves for the, their future. I would imagine that's what's going on. Yeah, it works both ways. Um, for I, I would conclude with this to my brothers and sisters that are still incarcerated. There's hope for, for me as a 21 year old. Uh, when I decided to make a change with my life, I said, I'm going to I'm going to create a goal setting system. And I don't know where I got it from. But I just started writing out some some crazy goals that I didn't even think were possible. I never even read a book before going to prison. I never finished one book. And I wrote down at the age of 21 that I'm gonna read 500 books. And I wrote down that I was gonna read the Bible 40 times. And I wrote down that I was gonna get my bachelor's degree. And, and I graduated from high school with a 1.7 GPA. You know, I averaged a D all four years because I didn't apply myself and I really didn't, I didn't care much and reading books was for squares. And then I started with my first book and then my second book. And by the time I paroled, I had read 750 books. And I'd keep a log. I'd keep a, a log and I'd write at least one sentence about the book, um, who wrote the book, the title of the book. And, and to this day, I can, I can remember at least one thing about each of those different books. And, and, I, and then I got involved with a uh, college and I was terrified. Uh, but my point is to immerse yourself, to think about all the good things that are available. Jason talked about there not being many programs. You know, I remember when I got to Soledad, I was in Soledad for 18 years and two months. And the only program there was AA in the cafeteria once a month. 
And now across that whole facility, there's like 122 different programs. And now with Prop 57 passing, there's different incentives that you can get milestones and rack hours and, and, and you get 80% of instead of 100% time. So I think we did the math one time and, and somebody even with a sentence like mine of 25 years to life could hypothetically, you know, maybe not in a COVID world, but, uh, you know, when all things are going normal, if you push hard for 12 or 13 years, you can be getting to the board after 13, 13, 14 years or so. Mm -hmm. So full immersion into, into um, like not only with uh, the programs and college or vocations, book reading, you know, I've heard some guys say before as well, like, well, they don't have this program available. We'll create it. I remember when the aha moments came on for me, like we, man, I wish we had something like Toastmasters here. And then someone said, well, why don't we create one? We started writing letters and we wrote to the Toastmasters International. Next thing you know, we, we, we were charter members of our, of the, our fully recognized Toastmasters inside Solid Ad Prison. And next thing you know, we had three gavel clubs that were meeting after that, you know, there were that little, little brand, uh, because our waiting list was so full, we had gavel clubs. So just a full immersion in those types of things. And then also getting around lifters, other people that are committed to the same things and, 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 and getting that perspective that what's most important, my most, what's most important in my life today is much different than it was when I was 20 years old. And, um, and when you do that, man, there's so much, so much that opens up for you. Well, thanks guys for letting me come into your homes today and talk about how we can provide more hope for those that are incarcerated and and it's been an interesting topic i think a good topic for next time might be like the challenges of re-entry or um i think that would be a uh, that would be a good one for for those that are on the verge of getting closer to to, to, to getting out so if you're if you're watching right now stay tuned for the next episode of <laughs> challenges of reentry. Thanks, Brian. All right. Thanks, Brian. Thanks.